Okay. Well, I'm I'm, de I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is John Hillsley, who is a, a very uh, famous name in the world of music and uh, a founder member of the legendary rock band Dire Straits. John, it is a, a real privilege and a pleasure to get you on the Godcast. How are you? Uh, I'm better now because I was searching for my eldest son's passport this morning because we're supposed to be going away next week and we'd lost it. All right, okay. Um, it was found at the bottom of some obscure box for some reason. Anyway, that's all good. So I, I, my day has improved immensely since then. <laughs> I think many of us yeah. can relate to that, the lost passport. <laughs> Where, whereabouts in the world are you, John? Where, where's home for you? Are you in well, the we live, um, we live, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, we live in the, we live in, um, in the New Forest. Uh, quite close to a place called Bewley, um, mm -hmm. which you might have heard of. Um, yeah. Famous for its abbey and all sorts of things. And um, the, the uh, Motor Museum, quite close to there. Uh, we've been here for th about 30 years now. So that's, this is home, definitely home. Yeah. Were, were you well, well travelled before that, John? Did, did you uh, live abroad for any period of your life? <laughs> I know you're well travelled. Um, <laughs> well, I, I used to, I had a place... In yeah, well, I'm pretty well travelled, yeah. Um, I had a place in Australia for a, a, quite a long time. Uh, I sort of have a, have a sort of a love affair with the place for some reason. I don't quite know. Well, I think it's rather beautiful, actually. Um, so I had a place out there for a bit and used to do quite long, a lot of long haul flights to go and stay there for a while. Uh, anyway, that, be, that we def decided to get rid of that after a bit because it was becoming a little bit crazy. Um, and now we... Uh, we have a small house in France where we we, we go uh, in the summer um, for a, for a while. We bought it really so the kids could uh, hopefully learn French, uh, but neither of them have done that, and neither have I. So we we failed in that respect. But um, uh, yeah, I think I think that um, we feel very comfortable here, and it's not too far from London because I do have to go there from time to time. And, yeah, yeah, uh, and do and do some work. Yeah. Um, John, I like to get a, a quite a, a diverse uh, range of guests on the Godcast, and I've been very fortunate. And uh, uh, just recently, I was talking to Tommy Cannon, who you will remember from uh, the legendary Cannon and Ball, and yeah, he, yeah. a gentleman in his in his eighties now. And um, we were just chatting last week, and and he said, you know, I like I still sometimes just have to pinch myself how how it all happened. And, and I was wondering if if that applied to you, John. Do you, do you sometimes reflect on? your career in music and think wow how, how did that happen or, or have you come to terms with it all now well i tell you what helped me come to terms with it really because um was was writing the book um mm. uh which came out um recently because i had to kind of backtrack and go right to the very beginning of of, of my life in leicestershire and 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 what i discovered that when i started to um put this story down right from the word go, from, you know, when I was born and all the rest of it, my parents, etc. But I discovered that life is a, is a, is a series of coincidences, which um, you make yourself often as not, and put yourself in a situation where things happen. And I discovered that, uh, you know, I was, I was never one to take the safe road, if you like, um, which used to completely freak my parents out. Um, having them coming through the war and they wanted us all to be safe. Um, and so they were worried about me, I think, and rightly so, <laughs> for quite a long time. Uh, uh, and um, until, you know, in my late 20s, when um, Mark and I and, and, and his brother David got the band together, and uh, th that completely freaked them out. They thought, oh, my God, now he's joined a rock and roll band. <laughs> well... They, they were tending to forget that I'd already, already been in about 15 bands until that time, but none of them had been very successful. And I kept saying to them, I think this one's going to be different, Dad. Um, and it, it, as it, and it, so it, it, it appeared to be so quite quickly. So he, he then changed his mind. He didn't know anything about music, really, apart from Vera Lynn, um, which, is, which is good. Um, but... Um, so he, he he said, okay, now I now I get it, kind of thing. And um, they used to come and visit on the road in, when, when they were driving through France, to their little place down in the south of France for a while in their, in their latter years, and they used to come and visit me on the road and would sit on the side of the stage and 
and um, uh, be given cups of tea by the roadies and been looked after. So that was rather lovely. And, and mm. so, uh, yes, I, I think that I don't exactly pinch myself. I, I just think that I'm extremely fortunate, but I, I feel like I've kind of made my own decisions in life. So I would have risen and fallen on those decisions. And as it happened, um, it, it went OK. Yeah. And, and, and as a boy, John, you, you I was reading that you grew up by the River Jordan, uh, this being the River Jordan in, in Leicestershire, not the one in, in <laughs> yes. Israel. Was, um, was, was childhood a happy time? And I was wondering whether there was any uh, spirituality in your life as a young guy. Did the parents take you to church and such such like? Well, of course, at that particular time, you know, when I, I, I was sent away to, to public school, quite early on at the age of 12 or 13, where it was compulsory to go to chapel every morning and uh, twice on a Saturday and twice on a Sunday. So I, I got to know um, a little bit about what you're, what you're talking about, but um, in some ways, uh, I, I think that, um, I love your quip about the River Jordan. I mean, it doesn't <laughs> quite have the connotations of the one you're thinking about. But, um, this was more of a sort of bit of a dribble of a stream. But anyway, um, I, I think I've discovered that I'm more of a spiritual sort of person than I would say religious. Now, that probably makes me religious being a spiritual person. I don't know. But um, I think that... Um, I feel that I certainly felt it when my parents passed away that I felt that they were kind of still with me mm -hmm. in, a, in a strange way. Um, and um, so I would constantly sort of consci unconsciously refer to them when I had something to, in my mind to sort out. So they're kind of their um, their spirit sort of lived on in me in a sense. And I, th and, I, and I think that this is, as human beings, I think this is what we do. We carry the past with us, uh, uh, people and places and such like, more people, which is much more relevant. And that, I think that has a sort of a significant effect on your, on the way you see the world. Mm. Um, it's, it, it, you know, I don't like particularly looking back and going, oh my goodness, whatever. But I just think this, you just are aware of, and I've lost quite a few people over the years, because, you know, when you get to a certain age, you do lose people, and that, that's very difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're dealing with that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I, I am, I, I would say I'm a very spiritual person, and I really feel that the spirit of the people that I've known still lives on. Um, yeah. And, and, I, and I get the feeling that some of us have been here before. I don't know, where, you know, certainly I get that with my children. I think, my God, where have you, where have you come from? You know. Um, yeah, absolutely. And what about, me? what about church music, John? I, a lot of the musicians I've um, interviewed, have, have, uh, I can think of an opera singer, Jonathan Antoine interviewed, who, who had a deep love of, you know, that was his kind of day job, but he had a real deep love of uh, heavy hard rock really and and i was wondering whether uh, you you enjoy church music um, you know as part as part of your education as a, a musician or whether it's something you've revisited uh, over the years you know choral choral even song and things like that uh well i think i think that i would what i would say about it is that music uh is a remarkable um uniter and I think that this goes for all kinds of music, whether it be um, hymns or uh, carols or choral music or, or rock and roll music, it brings people together. And I think that's really the most significant thing for me um, is how it unifies me, it unifies me with the rest of the world. And because I'm constantly reminded being in the position I'm in, how the music that we, we produced um, seems to touch people all over the world. And I think that these, I think it's a rather magnificent thing, you know, whether, whether it be a, I mean, I, I, I have to say I'm a sucker for a good carol. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I sort of open my lungs when I'm, you know, and, and of course one remembers all these hymns and stuff for when you were at, at school. So if there's any, if, if one's ever in a situation where, you know, the, 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 if you like, the more recognisable hymns are played, then I can join in quite easily. And I'd, 
you don't forget the words. And I think this is all part of our upbringing in a way. Um, I didn't really come from a highly religious family, I don't think. My parents were, um, you know, were churchgoers, but limited churchgoers, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Um, but we we all knew the local uh, chaplain at the at the at, the, at our little church in uh, in Leicestershire, you know, and, and um, probably like you, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, they, it's a very significant um, position in society, which I don't know whether it's got less now than it used to be, but certainly when I was growing up, one was aware of um, the effect that the the local rector or the or the chaplain would have on the community and so uh it was kind of just part of growing up really i mean and i think that you know i think religion is a, is a is a is a is a great joy a joiner of people it holds holds people together it sort of solidifies society mm. for me and of course i think that's where it, it sort of came from and was necessary when man put down his roots somewhere um they needed to have some guidance about how, how they were to behave. <laughs> so I think the Ten Commandments are sort of, you know, whether they're religious, see them as religious or otherwise, they, mm. they, they're quite wise words. They are, <laughs> yes, yeah, very, and they, very they sort of, They've stood the test of time. Indeed. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think that that, uh, and, and I think that good music stands the test of time, whether it be religious or whether it be rock and roll. Yeah. Um, I was, um, John, I was um, interested in all your thoughts about uh, this. Uh, I, was, I chatted to Vinnie Colawit about this subject and, and, and you're in, in quite a select group of people that have, have, that have played to masses of people, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I was watching uh, YouTube clips of Dire Straits and my own favourite band of Depeche Mode who, who also have played to huge crowds over the years, but and, and I've been in those crowds, and there is something utterly euphoric and incredible being in that congregation. Yeah, Vinny described it as I asked him what it was. What was that that was going on? He described it as, as a heavenly language. It was just, but but when you're on that stage and you are one of those guys looking back at that mass of people. What, what is going on in John Ilsley's mind when that is happening? Is it just the music or is it wow? Uh, well, it's a combination of a lot of things, actually. It, it's um, uh, There's an the extraordinary energy between the band and an audience, which is difficult to describe. And it becomes like a bit of a drug, which is why it's quite difficult to give this game up, even on a smaller scale. Of course, you know, when we got to those those big audiences, there was some extraordinary power going on a sort of symbiotic sort of relationship between as you rightly say masses of people coming to experience the same thing almost like a you know a, 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 a you know a, a glorious sort of seance or whatever you know a mass gathering all with the intention of enjoying the fruits of our labors i mean what bigger compliment can you be given than that and i and i think the one thing that the band had more than anything else was a respect for its audience and i think we only had to cancel one concert that i can remember uh, which wasn't our fault when the, when the when the stage collapsed about an hour before we were supposed to go on it this was in luxembourg thankfully there were thankfully there were about five thousand people there at the time but so we always we were always very much aware of the effort that people had made to come and see us and uh, had a a great respect for our audience because they're the ones that have put you there they're the ones that have uh, made you feel good about yourself and made you feel good about the music that you produced and there's really not much to dislike about it i mean it's it's very very hard work let me tell you uh when you're doing those very long tours psychologically and physically and mentally i mean it, i don't think people can really understand how difficult it is to keep everybody in place and i think that mark and i were quite good at um recognizing how difficult it is for everybody in the band including ourselves mm. to work uh, to hold that thing together night after night yeah uh, but it i mean 
you get you get you you come across some very uh, strange things in audiences from time to time, um, uh, which uh, you, you know remind me of the of the sort of the vagaries of uh, human beings how they <laughs> how they choose to behave or whatever. I mean, it's it's quite interesting over the years you come across some in, it's quite interesting moments. I have to say, yeah. And just rewinding a few years, John, what was the when when Dire Straits with when you put the band together? What was the what was the what was the target? Were you, were you seeking worldwide domination, or was it just to make good music, <laughs> or was it simply to get a, a record deal? What, what what was the driving force for you? Well, the driving force actually was the fact that it sounded really good when we played together. Yeah, it's a, it's as simple as that actually. And I realized that when I met Mark, that I was in the present. I mean, I'd played with a lot of guitar players before I met Mark. And I realized I was in the presence of somebody who was very different from everybody else that I had played with. Um, what was the difference, just, John? What was the, what was well, the, the, what was the, the well, magic ingredient? Well, the magic ingredient was, was that I, I, I'd never met anybody picking and playing the guitar like he did. It was just, it was a combination of so many different musical genres, which of course he'd actually um, synthesized over the years of his playing before I met him when he was 26, 27. And uh, I mean, it turned out we'd been listening to the same kinds of music, which of course is a, was, a, was, was quite a useful um, realization. Um, but when we just sat down and started playing, I thought, now this is really different from what I've done before, and um, I think this might work. Um, I was a student at the time; I'd given up a job, and I was a student at Goldsmiths College. And I and I thought, well, I, you know, I think we we should give this a go. And um, so it was really just how we sat down and played together for the first. We didn't have any idea about where this thing was going at all. I mean, I think. When we sat down and played together, I think Mark had written about three or four songs or something. That was about it. Yeah. The rest of the stuff we were playing <clears throat> were other people's songs. In order to put a, a set together of about an hour, we had four or five of ours and then six or seven of somebody else's, like Ry Cooder and uh, Chuck Berry. And I think we did an Elvis song occasionally uh, and uh, things like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be good to know uh, how you actually make it work uh, <laughs> when you first start, but you don't really know. And we were fortunate that um, a DJ in London, who I vaguely knew, uh, listened to a demo tape that we'd made and put it on the radio. So that's that's what kicked things off a bit. And so we were suddenly had to, you do a lot of catching up uh, from being a humble you know, band living in a council flat in Deptford to um, everybody in the music business wanting a bit of the action, mm. um, which took us all a bit by surprise. I mean, I have yeah. to say, it did take us by surprise. We weren't expecting it. <clears throat> John, my, my initiation into Dire Straits, so I, was, uh, I was 12, it was 1982, and um, I'd heard um, private investigations on the radio, and, and, I, and I thought, wow, this is good. I need to record this on my, my Sony radio cassette player. But I used uh -huh. to... I didn't have a lot of pocket money, so and I had to save up to get a, a, a TDK D90, so it was 45 minutes. So I used to record the charts. I know it was illegal, but I just, you know, and I wanted to make sure I had enough on my tape. <laughs> but but even then, I mean, Die Straight, you were you were making great headway, but but this was before Brothers in Arms, wasn't it? Yeah. And then and then all of a sudden Brothers in Arms is on the horizon. Did you get a sense that you were going to be elevated to um, to such heights of success. Did, did you did you see it coming at that point back in eighty two? Well, I think that um, before before Brothers came out, we'd had four very successful albums before that. We'd had the first album was was, was still selling in nineteen eighty two. Communicate was a, was a good seller, and then when Making Movies came out, that really took off. Um, that was a big sea change musically for us. We'd, we'd, we'd moved into a slightly different phase, I think. And then, of course, Love of a Gold with Private Investigations and, and Telegraph Road on was another 
uh, move. Uh, so we had we had a pretty big worldwide uh, support from fans, and Brothers was just a sort of culmination, I think, of all that uh, trial and error that we were. We, we, we went through when we were doing those other albums and it, it just sort of symbolized really where the band was at that time and of course there was there were a couple of two or three songs on that which really uh did things which we never expected i mean money for nothing okay and you know and then walk of life and the walk of life nearly didn't make it on the record funnily enough which sounds crazy right now um and suddenly it, it I don't know who, who can really explain these things, but suddenly something captures the public's imagination. But it was a combination, Alex, if, if you remember, the CD came out, mm -hmm. uh, MTV uh, broke in. I think we were one of the first acts on MTV with that, uh, that the, MTV, the Money for Nothing video. So a lot of things came together at that particular time, not just the album, but the development of new technology, uh, the computer graphics of, of Money for Nothing video, which really uh, was a, a life changer for people. It had never been done before. Steve Barron, the, uh, the uh, director, managed to squeeze an awful lot of money out of the record company to get that made. And they nearly fainted when they got the bill. Uh, <laughs> but that really changed things hugely, all those three things coming together. And the fact that the band had sold a lot of records, don't forget, before Brothers in Arms came out. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got to tell you, John, I, you know, um, I was that kid delivering the fridge freezers and the microwave oven. That I was 15 <laughs> and my first job was with Curry's and I, and I used to go out as a van, I was a van assistant and we used to have it on mm -hmm. the radio. And it's like, I am this guy, I'm delivering these refrigerations. That's, that's me, that's me, I'm doing this. <laughs> Well, it's just, it, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, that was just an observation that Mark made in this white goods shop in New York. You know, it, it, he literally just wrote down what these blokes were saying when they were watching Michael Jackson on the on, on all these TV sets. And uh, uh, just, it, I mean, writing songs is, is just being a good observer of everyday life, really, and what people get up to. Yeah. So I mean, you you and your van delivering, you know, refrigerators and TV sets to people were probably saying things to each other that, you know, could have quite easily ended up in a song. You yeah, never know. Quite possibly. I mean, songs come from songs come from all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. They really do. Uh, yeah. And and with that success of uh, Brothers John, um, did, was that an enjoy enjoyable time? Did you enjoy riding the crest of that wave? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I was very much aware of the fact that I was enjoying the success of the band and so was Mark and everybody else involved in it. I didn't like the fame bit very much. I was never very keen on that. So we sort of avoided that as much as possible. But I don't think there's anything wrong with success. Being successful at what you do, I think, is, 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 a, is a really good thing. I mean, it's not to be, it's not to be embarrassed about. Uh, it's, it's to be celebrated but as i say the fame bit is 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 that's the that's the awkward bit i think you know when people put you on pedestals and things and try to avoid as much of that as possible to be perfectly honest yeah. um so that you could actually go down into the local pub and have a pint and, without people pointing at you yeah yeah i mean and can I'm you imagine what it's like for paul mccartney to go and get a beer <laughs> you know. hell actually <laughs> And John, and on the other side of that, you know, when when um, when you went your separate ways, I've, I've asked a number of musicians this. You know, was there was there a time of uh, grieving? You know, was there a, a period of kind of mourning, not being in the band anymore, the band not being together anymore? How, was, just just share a bit of how that was mm. for you after those after those days and weeks. Well, that's a good question. Putting it into that sort of uh, that that frame, grieving. I think in a sense, grieving is probably the right word, even though uh, it was a decision that Mark and I made together to, to, to stop the band because it, was, it had got to such a scale that neither of, us, neither of us, A, wanted to do it at that scale again, and B, we were absolutely exhausted. So we, we really just needed to 
back away, get away from the whole thing. It had become this enormous sort of machine in a way, which we'd, we'd never really thought um, was ever going to happen, but it, it had happened. And, and we'd, we'd ridden the crest of that wave and we, we, we literally looked at each other and went, we gotta, we got to stop this. this is, we're going to go mad if we don't stop this. This is crazy. And, you know, that last tour we played to, I think, seven and a half million people or something ridiculous, which is absurd when you think about it. Um, and I think, oh, my goodness me, what, what you know, you, I look back and go, what was that about? Mm -hmm. But in fact, actually, when I, when I came off the road, I hung the guitar up, heard the bass guitar up, and I said, right, I don't, I'm not going to talk to you for a, quite a while. I just want to just do something different. So I, I, I painted, I, I, I took up painting, which I've always loved doing in a very amateurish point of view. And I, I got myself a small studio in London and literally immersed myself in painting. But I, I it, it, to fill the vacuum really, to fill the vacuum of, which, which was created by stopping this, this thing, you know, which had become huge, uh, excuse me, huge at the time. And painting really helped me to get through all that. Yeah. And um, I, and and in fact, actually, it's it's I do that. I mean, I've been in the studio this morning, trying to paint something half decent, which has been extremely difficult. But anyway, we're getting there slowly. Um, so I, I I do both now. I do music on a very small scale, and I do painting on a on a, a even smaller scale. Yeah. Um, but um, that that really fulfills my needs, to be honest, my creative needs. I'm I'm. I'm 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 fine with that, you know. When when you when you went your separate ways, John, was it kind of a final decision at that point? Was it kind of that's it, game over, or was there an intention to revisit it after a break, or or, or you know, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you could be signed up for a lot of money to get back together, but um, are you content how it how it how it's ended up that it that it seems to be final now? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, all, all good things come to an end. I mean, you know, and, and I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 Mark and I have remained very good friends, which is, which is good. Um, and, I, and I see some of the other guys from time to time. Um, I'm very, very happy with, with uh, the way things are. Um, I'd be a liar if I didn't say, wouldn't it be great just to do one more concert? But I tell you what, the energy necessary to put a Dire Straits thing together would be so enormous. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've got the got <laughs> the energy for it. But uh, you know, I, I can quite understand why some bands come back together again after ten or fifteen years and for one final one final hurrah. Mm. Uh, it, it's a difficult a drug to give up. I mean, I, I go out touring now in a very modest way and um, I really love it. I mean, I love it. I've got two crew and I've got a, a, a you know, small um, outfit with me. Just we go out as a five piece and we just, you know, we do the odd festival here and then. Um, and I'm going out on the road in April. I think it is April this year Yeah, uh, for a couple of weeks. And that does that that suits me very nicely. I don't want to I don't want to be away for long periods of time anymore. It's 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 very destructive on it on home life. It really is. That's one of the biggest problems with being away for a long time is that one family, your your rock and roll family, is very different from your normal home life, which most people experience. So when you come back, you are literally wondering, oh my god, how do I make a cup of coffee? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How do I get a plane ticket? What, yeah, you know. What, uh, oh, I've got to put some petrol in the car, you know. Yeah, it's, all yeah. it's all that sort of nonsense, really. Yeah. And, John, and John, are you still excited by music? Are you, are you a, a rock and oh, roller yeah. that, you know, when you want to listen to a bit of music, you delve into the 70s prog rock? Or or are you a, a musician <laughs> that looks forward? And, you know, you, do you see Cantony music still? Well, I rely on my children to bring me uh, new, new music, and they do on a regular basis. And I'm still making music. I've got an album coming out in... Oh, three weeks, I think, my eighth solo album, would you believe? Mm -hmm. uh, not many people know that, but um, that's coming out. And uh, so, yes, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a sucker for singer-songwriters, so I, 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 I like a good song. I'm not really particularly excited about a lot of the music that's on the radio these days. Uh, I just 
find it a little bit too uh, empty for me and a bit um, manufactured. Uh, yeah. I like I like the I like the excitement of uh, music when people haven't ironed it all out, you know, made it and smoothed it out. I like I like music to still have a bit of an edge to it. Um, Absolutely, I, I um I went to Tramlines Festival last year with my wife and young daughter, and it was it was fabulous. Actually, they had a BBC introducing stage there, a lot of new young bands, obviously yeah. cutting their teeth, working it all out. But but John just as we come to the end of this interview it's quite tough for young musicians isn't it i mean you know in, in your day you know you could sell a record and it would be financially rewarding for young, yeah. for young musicians it's not the same is it you know spotify pays at top and tape near whatever it is for a piece of music um not, not even that much well, you know and, I, and i'm sure a few i'm sure a few aspiring musicians will watch this interview what, what what's your advice to young bands as they set out on their journey of, uh, of rock and roll? Well, you raise a very interesting point, and it's something that is troubling um, uh, not just young musicians, but older musicians too, who recognise the fact that um, it is very difficult for young people to get together, make a band, create music, go out and play it. It's very difficult to go and play abroad right now because of the Brexit regulations, which is a complete disaster, which needs to be looked at very rapidly. You're quite right, Spotify pays peanuts. Um, so you can't really survive on that. So you've got, you've got to do gigs. But of course, in the last couple of years, there haven't really been any gigs. So it's been very, very, very tough for a lot of people starting out. But the interesting thing about all this is it doesn't stop people for, from trying. And I think that... Uh, you know, it's probably a very, very small percentage of people who uh, who actually hate to use the word make it, but actually survive in in the music business right now because um, it's 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 very hard work. When we first started out, you're quite right. We had an album to sell, and we had a tour. There wasn't any videos. There wasn't any MTV. There wasn't downloads. There was nothing like that. You actually got paid something for what you produced. And that is, it's a scandal that's going on at the moment. And the, and the reason why it's happened is because the record companies and Spotify have got complete control over how much they pay you. And it's, 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 an, it's an abysmal sum. It's an abysmal sum for people like, even like, you know, bands like Dire Straits. I mean, I'm not, I'm, don't tell me, I'm not complaining at all, by the way. Financially, we're fine. But... When you see your income halved, literally halved, in the last few years, and uh, you know you're selling the same amount of stuff and it's hard, how difficult is it is for these you, you know young aspiring musicians to actually survive? I think it's it's incredibly tough and it's very very short sighted because music the music business if you like because it's separate from the music you've got the music and you've got the music business the music business survives on new talent and if they don't encourage that talent and pay them properly for what they produce they're going to lose it that's all i would say so they have to be very very careful about how they uh, treat these young musicians that are coming up, I think it's 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 pretty poor at the moment, and I think they really need to reflect on that. And I know there's some serious conversations going on, mostly by managers and bands that have got power, because it's the only way you shift these things if you've got some power. And you say, you know, these things should change. It's okay for us, but it's not okay for the rest of these guys who are coming up and trying to make a living. John, it's clearly something that uh, that you're passionate about, and and I think yeah. it's great that people champion the cause of young young musicians. John, I've loved I've loved this forty minutes chatting to you. It's been absolutely fabulous, and it sounds like you've got a busy year. You've got the book "My Life in Dire Straits." Is that that's what it's called? Is it? Yeah. Yes, it's out and out, and you know it's being read by quite a few people. I should be pleased to say. Um, yeah, uh, and that's coming out, and then the the album's coming out, and Yep, I'll do a few gigs this year and um, go out and have some fun. And, and final question, John. Um, I'm up in East Lancashire. Is Lancashire you are? Is it a, a place you're familiar with? 
I think we're coming up that way. I, uh, we, we had a, um, if you look online, I think we're coming up that way. Okay. Uh, I can't remember where it is now. Um, well, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. And if there's, a, if there's, um, I'll find it and I'll link it to the interview and then people can, yeah. can uh, check that out if they'd like to come along and see you up in the north yeah, of if you have a look if you have a look on johnilsley.com that's where all the tour dates are i will um, and then if, if you'd like to come along then let me know and i mean come and see what we do these days <laughs> certainly well, well that is an invitation not to be turned down john john no, john thanks ever so much thank you so much for your time and uh, we send our love to you from east lancashire down down to the thank new you. forest and, and thanks for coming on the godcast thank you oh it's a pleasure alex nice to talk to you